You've heard the headlines. There are at least 20 confirmed cases of monkeypox in the U.S. Well, monkeypox can be severe and even fatal. Experts agree that the current outbreak is very important for people to understand. The reason that there is a lot of alarm about this organization is considering even one case of monkeypox in a non-endemic country as an outbreak. But what exactly is monkeypox and why is it emerging as a potential threat? It is a cousin of smallpox, which is, of course, our ancient enemy. But we vanquished smallpox, and we can vanquish this if it comes to it. Ray Watt Dionandan is a global health epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa in Canada. He says it can be a concerning virus, but it probably won't cause the next pandemic. I would, in a scale of 1 to 10, I would give it a 2 a pandemic potential. There are other candidates that are scarier. We'll explain the best ways to prepare for monkeypox and how to keep your company running in the event of an outbreak. Having a plan of how to cohort the workforce is useful too, meaning that if you think that this cohort of individuals in your workspace have been infected, do you have a plan to remove them from the workspace? We'll also look at why we may be entering a new age of infectious diseases and pandemics. Hi there, I'm Tristan Field-Jones, and welcome to another edition of SITREP. Raywat Dionandan joins us now, and Raywat, you're quite the expert in your field. So tell us about uh, what you do and, and how you became an epidemiologist. Oh, that's a loaded question. I am an epidemiologist, uh, particularly a global health epidemiologist is what I call myself, meaning I don't uh, specialize in any one disease. And I'm an associate professor at the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Ottawa. I became an epidemiologist uh, when one night during my master's degree in neuroscience, bouncing laser beams off my eyes in a lab at three in the morning, I realized, what have I done with my life? <laughs> and I have to figure out, what can I become now that doesn't involve working with my hands, that will always be relevant, involves travel, will always keep me employed, and is a fun thing to talk about at cocktail parties. And I found this thing called epidemiology, did a PhD in that, and uh, history has unfolded the way I hoped it would. Well, that's fantastic, Ray Watt, and we will explain to our audience, which consists mainly of security professionals and, you know, crisis managers, why we're talking uh, to you. And, and in fact, uh, you know, in my old job, I spoke with you on a regular basis uh, as a as a radio journalist. So, uh, you know, it's it's funny, and, and this is very much a backhanded compliment. I was hoping, oh boy, maybe I don't have to talk to Ray Watt Dionandan again about, you know, viruses, because the elephant in the room being COVID-19, we had frequent conversations. But now we have potentially a new virus that you know, may cause some concern, maybe not. We're going to dive into that and sort of how to prepare for uh, what they're calling monkeypox and whether or not it's a concern. We'll get into all that. First of all, uh, tell us about the virus. How and when was it first identified? Because unlike COVID, this isn't exactly brand new. Yeah, it's in the pox family. And we have a lot of pathogens ancient enemies of mankind within the orthopox family, including smallpox and uh, cowpox and camelpox and all the fun animal slash poxes. This one was identified, I believe, in 1958 in Copenhagen, of all places, in a uh, collection of captive monkeys, hence the name monkeypox. But it is common to Central and West Africa. In fact, it is rare to find cases outside of Africa, which makes the current situation so unusual. And it's not typically found in monkeys, it's found in rodents. It's just by accident that it was first discovered in monkeys in the 50s. And so the name has stuck unfairly to our simian brothers, I would just say. And it's been with us, uh, well, for centuries, but only identified in the scientific literature since uh, the 50s or so. As a result, it's not like COVID in the sense that we have a lot of experience with it. But it's also not as well studied as, say, smallpox was, or tuberculosis, or any of the other ancient diseases that have plagued mankind for millennia. Um, a lot of good news here, and a lot of bad news. Um, the good news is that we have experience with it. We have a vaccine for it. We have treatments for it. We know how it presents. We think we know how it's spread. We think we understand what its natural course and its prognosis is going to be. The bad news is that it's, yeah, it is a big deal. Like if you get it, be a little worried, um, not overly worried, but a little worried. It's not the flu, it's a little more serious than that. Um, and it is a cousin of smallpox, which is of course our ancient enemy. 
But we vanquished smallpox, and we can vanquish this if it comes to it. I first became aware of monkeypox during my studies when it was identified as a potential candidate for a pandemic and also a candidate for weaponization, as uh, many of the poxes are. Um, that's one of the main reasons that many governments have stockpiled the appropriate vaccines against monkeypox because of the threat of some wayward nation weaponizing this, uh, this vile threat. What do we know about the typical symptoms of monkeypox and uh, so far hospitalizations, death rates? What are the details uh, of, of, of that? Well, first, how is it transmitted? Um, the CDC says it's transmitted through contact with someone's broken skin uh, or the respira respiratory tract, mucous membranes, and so forth. So kind of like COVID in that if someone breathes directly into your face and the respiratory droplets end up incident on your mucous membranes, then you can get it that way. Or you touch an open sore and it ends up somehow in your mucous membranes. Unlike COVID, you can get it from, let's say, using the same bed sheets as someone with an open monkeypox sore, and you get it that way. We call that fomite transmission. That's not common in COVID, uh, it is common this way. Uh, is it aerosolized? Is it airborne? Uh, at least one study suggests that there is an aerosolized component to monkeypox transmission, which might explain some of what we're seeing right now in that it has been detected in like a score of countries at the moment, probably through uh, travel on an airplane. And it, uh, it's a DNA virus, not an RNA virus. So COVID, if you don't know, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is an RNA virus, which might explain why it mutates so much. The monkeypox virus appears to be stable, so it's not mutating particularly quickly. As a result, our, um, our vaccines are expected to work with known efficacy. So how does it present? Um, it presents first as uh, a fever, and in a couple of weeks, you start getting these rashes, these little circular scars on the extremities of your body, your hands and your face kind of like smallpox, which is why it's kind of scary looking. And most cases, the overwhelming majority of cases resolve on their own in two to four weeks. It's just that while you have it, it's pretty clear you've got it and it's scary looking and it's contagious. Um, but a certain fraction will not resolve or will require some help in having it resolved. Um, there are two strains of monkeypox. We should be aware of that, at least two strains, the Congo strain and the West African strain. The Congo strain is the more dangerous of the two. It has a case fatality rate, which is the fraction of cases which are known to die of about 10%. It's a high number. The West African clade or version has a much lower case fatality rate, somewhere around 4%, but um, it's probably lower than that once it enters the Western nations because case fatality rate is a function of the quality of your healthcare system. And it's the West African clade that we think we're seeing spreading around the world. So that's good news. It's the less fatal of the two. It's more fatal for children. So we have to make sure we watch if this penetrates into the pediatric population and it becomes more of an emergency. Um, so uh, people are spooked by the visible symptoms of it, but I think that's a good thing. It's a good thing to have these visible symptoms. Uh, that way you know who's got it. You can quarantine those individuals, and you're only contagious, we think, while you are symptomatic, unlike COVID, which has that stealth transmission component where people are spreading it before they show symptoms. So um, that allows us to contain it much better as well. I'm hearing already a lot of good news in regards to this virus, which is such a relief because we're all on edge as a result of COVID-19. Uh, and it definitely sounds like quite a, a different scenario would play out if uh, you know, it ended up being, you know, transmitted maybe in a different way or more widespread. And and I think, Raywat, that's a question that's on a lot of people's minds when we compare it to COVID, because COVID and especially the recent Omicron variant is known as being one of the most contagious uh, viruses ever that we've seen. How does monkeypox compare to that? At this point, everyone is a bit of an expert on infectious disease epidemiology. We all know what the reproduction number is. That's the average number of new infections a current infection will produce before it's resolved. And your current infection is resolved either 
by you being cured or you dying. But before it's resolved, how many people are you going to infect? So measles, one of the most infectious diseases we know, um, has a reproduction number of about 16 to 18, extremely high. The original version of COVID, of SARS-CoV-2, was maybe three or four. The current Omicron version is about eight, or maybe even as high as 12, depending upon which measurement you take, which makes it one of the most inf- uh, contagious respiratory viruses we've ever seen. Smallpox was probably a three. And smallpox, of course, devastated many civilizations. Monkeypox, uh, it's hard to say, but one modeling exercise puts it at around 2.13. Others suggest somewhere between one and two. So it's nowhere near as contagious as COVID. Nowhere near. Uh, Still, anything above one is technically exponential growth. So it still could take root in your community if the appropriate mitigation tools are not put into place. So again, the good news here is that even though uh, a reproduction number of 2.13 is technically exponential growth, if you use things like masking and distancing and hand washing, um, and really monitor if they're being adhered to, you can stop this thing dead in its tracks with standard public health interventions. And you, like you mentioned earlier, monkeypox is not new. It's not like COVID, which has been identified just over the last couple of years. So there is treatment available. We know a little bit more about it, at least. So I guess the question now is, Ray Watt, why is it making headlines <laughs> today? Well, it is definitely news. Even if we weren't coming off of the fear of COVID, and by the way, the COVID pandemic is not over yet, seems to be waning somewhat, depending upon which measurement you look at, it's not over. Um, We are primed at the moment to be thinking about infectious disease epidemics and pandemics because we've seen the power of such a thing to grind society to a halt. The economic consequences, the ideological consequences, the direct challenges to our philosophies of living, to democracy itself. Pandemics are nothing to sneeze at. They're they're quite disruptive, as I think we all understand now. So the idea that another disease is coming around the corner with pandemic potential, I think we should take that seriously and be aware that um, anything of this nature should have resources thrown at it to prevent it from becoming bigger than it is. We have to remember that this is not the first time monkeypox has escaped from Africa. In 2003, about 70 cases were known to happen in the USA. And by the way, none of those cases we think were the result of human to human transmission. They were all the result of people getting it from these exported animals from Ghana. Every single one of those cases was successfully treated and no one died. So the fact that we know our public health measures work against uh, a known large outbreak outside of Africa tells us that we can get a handle on this unless we drop our guard and let it spread very quickly. Public health is worrying about it. That's their job. Let them worry about it and get out of their way. Allow them to case uh, contact trace. Allow them to diagnose. Allow them to do ring vaccination with the existing supply of vaccines that we have and just let them do their job. And this can be contained relatively well, unless, (laughs) unless there's an element of transmission here we are unaware of. Because we have outbreaks from 20 countries that don't seem to be linked, but that's a little confusing. Uh, so once that's investigated uh, a little bit more, but um, uh, I don't think it's untoward to have the calibrated reaction we're having right now. Yeah. Well, and, and you talked a little bit there about the fact that this virus has been found in multiple countries, which again is a little bit unusual. Do we have any early ideas or any hypotheses in terms of why we're seeing these outbreaks simultaneously in different parts of the world where the virus isn't typically found? Yeah, not really. Um, A large proportion of these cases are the result of men having sex with men. I say that carefully uh, because uh, we don't want to stigmatize a particular demographic. It's not a gay disease. It's not a sexual disease. Uh, We know that Ebola and Zika virus have been found in semen, for example. We don't think about Ebola and Zika as sexual diseases. It just happens that it happen. It can be transmitted that way. That's what's happening here. One possibility is that uh, the airborne nature of transmission was underrepresented and maybe understated. And um, you just need to be monitoring that better. But uh, I, I don't know. The answer to your question, I don't know. I'm, I'm stumbling for a good answer there. But frankly, it's a bit of a mystery at the moment. 
you said two words earlier in our conversation here, pandemic potential. <laughs> I need to ask this because a lot of people are asking this, and especially since, you know, this show was all about, you know, hope for the best, plan for the worst. So we need to plan for the worst. What is the pandemic potential for monkeypox based off of what we know so far? It's not as high as influenza or respiratory viruses with high base reproduction numbers um, and with the stealth transmission potential. I would, in a scale of one to 10, I would give it a two, a pandemic potential. Um, and the reason it's so low is because, again, the symptoms are obvious, um, because it doesn't spread when you're not symptomatic, uh, and because we have treatment and vaccine for it. So when we identify an outbreak, we can suppress that outbreak through something called ring vaccination, which we vaccinate all the people who have it and all the people who are close contacts of them. So I'll give it a low potential. There are other candidates that are uh, scarier. I think influenza is actually scarier because uh, influenza strains can emerge every year that are new and scary, um, that are zoonotic, meaning that they have jumped from an animal species into the human transmission experience and are causing ruckus that way. Uh, never take your eye off an influenza virus. So it's just, this, it's got the word pox in it, which is scary for people. I understand that if we've lived through smallpox and I'm old enough to remember smallpox vaguely, uh, smallpox is scary and has killed tens of millions, if not more people historically, how many of it's likely. So, and we have to get past the emotional impact of an ugly disease like monkey pox and smallpox and be more afraid of the invisible diseases that can strike you down uh, stealthily. Having said all that, we still need to prepare for this. We still need to prepare for the possibility that monkey pox may become more transmissible, especially if they find out that maybe it is aerosolized or maybe there are other ways of it being transmitted that we weren't aware of previously. So when it comes to the preparations for monkey pox, Let's just start with the basics here. What should companies and large organizations do just in case? Good question. Let's, well, let's start with the government. Then we can move down to, to companies. Government needs to invest in stockpiles of the appropriate therapeutics and preventatives. There are at least two therapeutics we know about. One whose name I know of, Tecoviramat, the antiviral that has been known to be effective against uh, poxes of all kinds, including monkeypox. I think its commercial name is T-pox. So getting a stockpile of that is a good idea. Um, getting stockpiles of the known vaccine. If you're as old as I am and you've got your smallpox scar, uh, it means you've got some limited immunity to this. Um, immunity against smallpox confers about 80%, 85% immunity against monkeypox. The old smallpox vaccines probably expired in your body if it's been more than five years, as it has for almost everybody. At the company level, I think symptom checks are important. Uh, asking people to stay away if they've got a fever or if they've got a fever to inquire with their doctor to explore why they might be having a fever. If you have the telltale signals of a rash, by all means, you stay away from work or get it checked out. Um, improving ventilation is an investment that pays endless dividends. So we're talking here about the appropriate filters. HEPA filters are appropriate for hospital settings. HEPA filters can reduce air pressure considerably in modern buildings. So that's not the ideal standard for most office buildings, but a MERV 13 to 16 filtration system um, can reduce the load of viral diseases substantially. And installing CO2 monitors to keep track of exactly how good your ventilation is, is a good idea. It's, it's cheap, it's easily monitored. The idea here is to um, is to look at how much CO2 you have in a given room versus the outdoor air. You want to disincentivize people from coming to work when they're sick. And in fact, if, they, if their livelihood depends on them working when sick, you've done the opposite. You've incentivized them infecting other people. So that's not a good thing. Having a plan of how to corpuscularize a cohort, your workforce is useful too meaning that if you think that this cohort of individuals in your workspace have been infected, do you have a plan to remove them from the workspace and allowing the rest of the machine to continue on functioning? So how modular is your work environment? Um, that's not to say people should be, should be prevented from interacting. I think 
from a management perspective, the opposite should be true. They should be encouraged to interact and to network. But um, physically speaking, do you have an idea of where people are spending most of their time? And if so, um, can you remove those individuals once the infection is identified? And do you have a deep cleaning option if you end up having to use it? So deep cleaning was popular in the early days of COVID-19 when we thought wiping down your groceries and your doorknobs was the way to prevent infection. We know now that that kind of transmission, we call that foam like transmission, is not a big deal with COVID. Uh, maybe a handful of people globally have been affected that way, but nowhere near the amounts affected by a aerosol or droplet transmission. But with monkeypox and the common colds and the flu, frankly, deep cleaning can have an enormous impact. So having uh, a dedicated um, regular cleaning regimen in your workspace, I think would be very good. Um, I think those measures are probably sufficient to keep your workplace relatively infection-free. Masking will work for monkeypox and related illnesses. Um, as we see, masking is politically laden and can create sociological divisions in the workplace. So keep it as an option in the event of an emergency. Say, uh, we know that uh, an outbreak has happened here. We ask you to wear your mask for the next X days while public health investigates and, and coordinates the response. Um, I think that would slow transmission. I think it's, it's a good idea to prevent the infection from getting into your workplace. That's the first goal. But if you fail in that goal, you should have a second plan to prevent it spreading from your workplace, within the workplace. A third goal from a public health standpoint should be, once it's spreading in the workplace, can you prevent it from getting into the community from your workplace? So the first two are relevant from the work manager's perspective. The last one is relevant from a public health perspective. And the way you prevent it from getting out of the workplace into the community is by allowing public health to do the ring vaccination strategy, the contact tracing, and permitting your employees to, to stay away longer if need be. A lot of this already sounds familiar, Ray Watt, because, <laughs> you know, we dealt with this through COVID for the last couple of years. So, so it sounds to me as if, uh, you know, a lot of people uh, have been, or maybe not a lot, but a fair number of people, I, I think it's fair to say, have been uh, excited to return to the office to see their colleagues. Um, and, you know, a lot of, especially downtown areas and cities are certainly welcoming back office workers uh, as, you know, again, we hope that the pandemic slowly you know, wanes over time. So do you, should uh, some of those pandemic precautions like, you know, allowing work from home and, you know, having a supply of masks uh, and again, the physical distancing, the cohorts, based off what you're saying, a lot of that should still remain in place, maybe not necessarily as an implementation yet, but definitely as an option that can be used uh, on a fairly short notice if necessary. I do want to add that unlike with COVID-19, a lot of the, the confusion is around when to return to work. With monkeypox, it's pretty obvious when you return to work, when the symptoms are gone. When the rash and fever are gone, you are not contagious anymore. You can come back. With COVID, you got to take two negative rapid tests two days in a row, and even then there's a probability that you're still infectious, so it's a little more blurry. So it's more clear-cut with, with pox-like diseases like this. A bigger picture concern that I've uh, read a little bit online here involves, uh, again, the fact that we're seeing simultaneous outbreaks in different parts of the world. And, and some of the literature out there, if you will, has indicated that this might be an indication of how the nature of viruses uh, is changing and how the behavior uh, could also be transforming. Now, again, it's a little early to tell with monkeypox. But overall, Ray Watt, would you say that's a fair assessment? Are we seeing viruses change their behavior or do we simply not have enough data to make a determination on that? Um, I would say the latter. And I'd also add it is unlikely that viruses are changing their behavior. It's more likely that we are changing our behavior and the environment is compelling other hosts and carriers to change their behavior. So what's happening that is causing an increase in perceived infectious disease outbreaks is multifold. We like to think of something called the epidemiologic transition. So bear with me here. The transition talks about three stages of human social evolution. In the first stage, we see the age of pandemics and infectious disease. This is when we're mostly an agricultural species. We're at the mercy of, uh, of the weather and of natural disasters. And many of us died before our 40th birthday. 
uh, due to things like the common cold and influenza and diarrhea. And the second age was the age of preceding pandemics. That's when we learned about vaccination and clean water and modalities of transmission. And as a result, suddenly we're living past 40. We're still dying a fair amount from uh, the flu and the common cold even, but it's not nearly as dire and the population starts to increase. The third age, which we thought we were in, was the age of man-made diseases. So diabetes, cancers, and so forth. So most of us, when we go, we're going because of one of those issues. And those are diseases of affluence, frankly. Now, those diseases of affluence have always been with us, but they're outshone by the presence of infectious disease. But since we beat back infectious disease with vaccination and antibiotics and clean living, that's when the cancers and the uh, um, heart diseases and so forth uh, saw their day. We might be seeing here a return to the age of pandemics and infectious diseases for a number of reasons. The antibiotics aren't working as much as they used to because we are abusing the antibiotics. There are a lot more people and people are encroaching into places in the world where we had not been ever before and are discovering new diseases. That's where Ebola and hantavirus came from, for example. People started going into parts of the country that previously they'd ever lived in and they were lifting up rocks and going into caves and lifting up brushes and suddenly uh, there's a new fungus or virus or bacteria infecting them. We have a globalized travel sphere. So we get onto a plane in Tokyo, get a disease, and before the incubation period is over, you're walking around New York. So the ability of diseases to spread around the world are lightning fast, much better than what evolution gave them in the first place. And we have a globalized economy. So the ability of a disease to hobble us economically and socially is now greater than ever before, as we saw through COVID-19. <clears throat> if COVID has come, had come along 100 years ago, it would have been horrible. Uh, people would have died in large amounts, but it would not have had the same economic impact, I don't think, because it would have not have affected supply chains, um, communication networks, et cetera, the way it did today because of the fragility of our interconnectedness. So all that combined is increasing two things. First, our ability to detect and find outbreaks. So maybe they're happening before, but now we know about them. And second, it might be actually increasing the number of infections and outbreaks because of the reasons I enumerated. In addition, we have climate change, which is changing the environments for how vectors move. So we're seeing uh, patterns of dengue and malaria change geographically quite profoundly because the uh, mosquito movements are different. Mosquito behavior is different because of climate change. So we're in a time of change, absolutely. Time of flux, and it's unclear where this will all land. Will we enter a new steady state? Or are we looking at just endless waves of strange diseases for the foreseeable future? Uh, kind of like we're looking at these strange changes in, in weather patterns and hurricanes and cyclones and so forth. Um, so buckle in. Uh, we're in unseen, unknown territory. And uh, good news is that we have appropriate tools to manage this. We have smart people to manage it. And uh, what we are most vulnerable about is our ideological fractures and our emotional fragility when it comes to uh, sustaining resilience against these threats. So with all that in mind, how should viruses and communicable diseases be part of a business continuity plan or a security plan, especially if, like you say, we may, and this isn't necessarily a, a guarantee, but we may be entering another age of pandemics and diseases uh, and that sort of thing. How do you plan for that if you're a security professional or if you're running a large organization or corporation, especially since what you're describing to me, Raywat, is probably... Uh, quite unusual to hear for, you know, generations of people who just grew up not really having to worry too much about pandemics. Yeah. A number of things to think about. One is you might want to consider vaccine mandates for workers. Uh, if not mandates, then certainly uh, plans for encouragement for the existing known vaccines that work against whatever the threat is. Number two is if you have a multinational corporation that you're managing, um, Portions of it might be impeded, shut down, hobbled when outbreaks happen in a particular nation. So can your organization work around that? Can they sustain um, the 
non the dysfunctionality of one component of their modular design. So relying upon one nation's output to, uh, uh, to the exclusion of all else might be a problem. Three is movement of peoples can be curtailed in the event of a pandemic, as we learned through COVID-19. So do you have a plan to continue functioning if people cannot flow between nations? Of course, the answer there is information can still flow. So protecting your information networks is critical here. Information networks are not susceptible to disease, they're susceptible to energy demands and other kinds of physical infrastructural challenges. So investing in, in uh, that rugification might be a way to go. Um, and having a solid health plan is also useful to make sure that when your employees do become sick, there, is, there isn't fear that they will be rendered onto poverty, that they have a, some sort of safety net to allow them to bounce back into the workforce to continue to be, be functional. Um, there's no way to be perfectly prepared for this. I think about it uh, along several axes. There's the human axis around healthcare, there's the infrastructure axis, and there's the supply chain axis, the resource allocation axis. So uh, I think um, we do our best to think about the likely outcomes and have in place contingency plans for disruption. I think getting appropriate information is also interesting and important, and we don't have good sources at the moment. There are a couple of companies that showed their worth in 2019 that identified the likelihood of COVID-19 stultifying pandemic early on, and they really underline the need for um, these private entities to step forward and do modeling specifically for corporations, not necessarily for government. And more of those are popping up at the moment, but having expertise on site that can interpret that information for business can be useful as well. Having someone who can say, well, you know, uh, the government's saying that this is a likely outcome, like, like the outcome, what does that mean for us? Uh, what do these numbers actually mean? What are the, the, the error margins here? Um, how can we trust this model of that number, et cetera? So I guess I'm putting in a plug for my profession. <laughs> have more people like me around that you can turn to, um, or people who are more computationally minded. Yeah, interesting. So really, the, the message here is if you're formulating your security plan or your business continuity strategy, and you don't really know uh, how to you know, take into account viruses or diseases like that, then reach out and talk to a health professional like yourself. Yeah, I think so too. I think so. I'm not just, I'm not a health professional. I'm not a clinician. I'm an epidemiologist. You need to talk to all of the above. So the, the people who understand the modeling, the people who understand how these decisions are made, who understand um, disease flow at the population level and disease challenge at the individual level. Those are actually different skill sets. Uh, I mean, I have spoken to some companies already around COVID-19. Some of the questions they always have are very simple ones like, is it safe to have this event? Can we plan three months from now to have this meeting somewhere? And my answer is, if you have the event, if you have the meeting, these are the steps you can take to minimize risk. You cannot reduce risk entirely, or reduce risk entirely. Um, if you want to invest in the appropriate infrastructure to remove it, risk entirely, well, that's, that's all communication-based. So invest in these communication platforms and so forth. So um, we're learning right now in real time the kind of, of information and advice that companies seem to want to need, but we have to divide that between the, the near term and the long term. Near term needs have to do with things I mentioned just now. Is this safe? Is that safe? Et cetera. Uh, how, what do I do in the event of this outbreak or that outbreak? The long term is um, how do I get the information I need to better make informed policy decisions? We're talking here about surveillance. If you're a large enough company, do you have the resources maybe to have your own surveillance network for disease? That's a bit of a stretch. Um, might not be a need for that. Governments are supposed to invest in surveillance networks and can you tap into those networks? If not, or if government has not done its job, maybe it's time for the private sector to do that work uh, instead. So surveillance, if you don't know, isn't big brother watching you work. Surveillance is keeping an eye out for the signals of a health threat. We have surveillance programs all over the world for things like tuberculosis and influenza, suicide ideation, mental health challenges, diabetes, whatever it might be. Um, surveillance failed us with COVID-19. Um, the signals were there, but the people were not present with the appropriate tools to really analyze that, those signals well to allow us to actually uh, scale the threat accordingly, with the exception 
of those handful of private sector modelers I talked about. So um, can you trust the state to do a good job there? I don't know. I hope so, but I don't know. So maybe it's time for the private sector to do social surveillance work. Uh, Raywat, really appreciate your insight. Uh, if we can just recap what we discussed here, because we started with monkeypox, and I think we need to do, because we've covered so much ground in this conversation. <laughs> uh, so with monkeypox, essentially, when it comes to the threats and the risks, if we had to recap it quickly, what are the most important points to consider and what should your prevention protocols be at the moment? Monkeypox is no joke. It's a real threat. It's a known threat, though. And we have a good vaccine for it. That's 85% effective. And we have good treatments for it. Most people will be just fine. A handful of people will not. So we have a ring vaccination strategy once cases are detected to suppress outbreaks when they happen. At the organizational level, doing things like symptom checks, good ventilation, and allowing public health access to your people will allow us, them, to suppress those outbreaks and keep your people and every, everyone safe um, when it happens. And advocating for government to uh, stockpile the appropriate treatments, the antivirals, and the known vaccines that work in, would also be useful. All right. Uh, Ray Watt, thank you for the terrific conversation. Uh, if people have more questions or if they maybe want to reach out or find out more about you, uh, where can they go? Yeah, my website is deonandan.com. That's my last name.com. D-E-O-N-A-N-D-A-N.com. And I'm a professor at the University of Ottawa. You can always find me there as well. And we'll have links for that uh, in the description uh, where uh, you'll, you should be able to find that information there. Raywat Dionandan, epidemiologist at the University of Ottawa here in Canada, joining us on SITREP. I'm Tristan Field-Jones. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, you can email me at sitrep at samdesk.io or follow us on Twitter at samdeskofficial. Until next time, stay safe out there. <laughs>